it is I, through many grievous toils now in the twentieth year, come to my native land. And yet I know that of my servants none but you desires my coming. From all the rest I have not heard one prayer that I return. To you, then, I will truly tell what shall hereafter be. If God by me subdues the lordly suitors, I will obtain you wives and give you wealth and homes established near my own. And henceforth in my eyes you shall be friends and brethren of Telemachus. Come then, and I will show you to a very trusty sign, that you may know me certainly and be assured in heart. The scar the boar dealt long ago with his white tusk, when I once journeyed to Parnassus with Autolycus' sons. All right, thanks, Dustin. That is going to be a quote that's coming into this episode. We've got a pretty big one coming at you now. So we left you off with a little bit of doubt with Odysseus. He's feeling it. He's starting to wonder, you know, what's his wife up to? She's throwing him a little couple curveballs. And in this episode, we're going to see if Penelope recognizes him. Because last time we left you off, uh, she'd asked to meet with him, but he hadn't come to her. And now he's going to have to have to have the the dreaded conversation again you yep. know? and while dustin reads this one to you just uh there, there's a couple different arguments that go on with uh penelope like what does she know does she recognize uh odysseus um does she like are her behaviors because she doesn't recognize them or are they because she does so as dustin tells it just try to try to keep in mind uh what you think it, and make your own opinion i'm going to go over a couple of the the major points that both sides tell um, so take it away, Dustin. You got this. All righty. So where we left you off, um, Odysseus has been teased by the suitors, and Penelope has heard that the stranger, which is Odysseus in disguise, knows or has seen Odysseus. So she wants to question him and has arranged a meeting for that night as to avoid suspicion from the suitors. So after the suitors have retired to go to bed, Odysseus and Telemachus begin storing all the weapons in the palace and the armor in like a kind of like a vault that they got in the palace. And the old nurse, uh, Euryclea, she sees them doing this and Telemachus tells her, he's like, well, you know, it's around all the armor and weapons around all this smoke all the time. It's starting to damage it. And I want to make sure all my father's things are kept in good condition. So I'm moving them to this little storage room. And she's like, oh, okay. That's yeah, cool. so, I mean, that checks out. I just was confused. But yeah, whatever. <laughs> she, you know, didn't really bother her too much. Yeah. But while they're doing this, you know, it's 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 nighttime and they don't have like electricity, so they don't have lights and flashlights or anything. But yet, it's very illuminated. They can see every corner of the room, and that's because Athena is there shining light upon them, so they can see what they're doing. And Telemachus points this out. He's like. Man, it must be a god or something, because this place is lit up. I can see everything. It's the origins of this place is lit. <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, it's kind of funny. Odysseus is just like, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, it's a god. Don't worry about it. I deal with him all the time. Yeah. Keep your pants on. Look. He's just <laughs> that's really, he's just like, yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah, yeah I talk to gods all the time. Your cool. dad, your old man, he uh, banged a few. Okay? I'll <laughs> yeah, tell you some yeah. stories later. <laughs> he did. He did. I'll tell you what. It shined. <laughs> <laughs> it sparkled with me. <laughs> so, so after that, Odysseus is like, well, I got to go meet with your mom. So you go on to bed and get some sleep. So with that, Odysseus sends Telemachus to bed and then he goes to meet with Penelope. Now, while he's waiting for Penelope, he's again insulted by the maid Menthus or Menthos. She's the one that insulted him earlier. She sees mm -hmm. him again. She's like, will you not just leave us alone? And, you know, talks about how dirty and nasty he is. And Odysseus calls her out. He's like, well, what have I done to you to make you hate me so much? Is it because I'm dirty? I don't have, you know, the means. I mean, she did tell him that, though. You yeah, know, she I don't did. Know, I don't know why he's asking. Like, is yeah, it I don't I'm either. dirty? I'm like, I mean, yes. I yeah, guess. that's exactly why. That's why I name called you. Yeah. yeah. And, he, together. and Well, he also tells her, he's like, you know, if Telemachus here's you, you know, he's not going to be happy that you're treating guests like this. So you should probably watch what you're saying. Well, unbeknownst to her, Penelope was listening and she comes in and this is where in the book, it's worded kind of weird. She says, you'll pay with your head. So I don't know if she's going to be executed mm -hmm. or if it was, 
because nothing really happens after she doesn't have her like taken away. She's just like, you're going to be executed. Now get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, if I know that, I'm not just going to be like, oh, okay, I'll go wait. Yeah. <laughs> you know she's, what I mean? she's mad at her. She's like, you, you know dang well that I told you to bring anybody who co- shows up here to me. And here you are berating him, asking him why he hasn't left because I want to know where my husband is. Right. And then she's like, oh, my gosh, the queen. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what she... <laughs> that's quote. exactly how it goes Sometimes down. Homer is beautiful. Sometimes he makes some weird uh, quotes. Yeah. Strange. It happens. I'm not paraphrasing. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I wish that's exactly what it said. <laughs> <laughs> so, after that, Penelope has a chair brought in for herself, and then she has a bench brought in for Odysseus, and they're sitting face to face. And then Penelope asks Odysseus where he's from, but initially Odysseus acts reluctant. He's like, you know, my past is too painful. I wish not to talk about it. So then Penelope starts talking about what she's had to go through, how her husband's been gone for 20 years. Her son has had to grow up around this chaos, you know, with no guiding figure pretty much. And then everyone's trying to force her to marry someone that she doesn't want to marry. She doesn't want to marry any of these guys. She just wants to be left alone if Odysseus isn't coming home. So she she tells of how she concocted the plan to uh, weave that uh, tunic for Laertes. Mm -hmm. And every night she would undo it. She'd be like, Hey, I want, when I'm done with this tunic, I'll marry somebody. But every night she would undo what she weaved that day. So it was always starting at the beginning. And then she tells how she eventually got outed for that, that, you know, they caught her. So she, she's forced to, you know, she's in a really sticky situation and she's like, you can't, you know, I told you my bad stuff. Don't tell me yours. And then with that, Odysseus is like, okay, yeah, that's a fair point. So again, he tells her he's he goes back to Crete. Crete's his go-to when he needs to make yep. something up. But this time, he kind of spices it up. He says he's from Crete, but that he's the younger brother of Adamaneus. So he's giving himself a little more status when talking to Penelope. And that his name is Athan. And ten days after Adamaneus left, Odysseus actually arrived in Crete seeking... Uh, Adamaneus. The reason they arrived in Crete is because of a storm blew them off course and they had to stop in Crete to weather out the storm. Well, since Adamaneus actually left 10 days before Odysseus got there. Now, I know this sounds confusing because Athan is Odysseus and I'm <laughs> it, 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 it's really hard to keep track of because Odysseus is telling the story about meeting Odysseus. And he's like, what a hunk. Yeah. Should have seen... <laughs> I heard a couple of people call him Boudicius. I don't know what that was about, but it was it was a good booty. Yeah, what he said. And yeah. the, he does. We'll get to that in a second. The he does eyes on that man. Yeah, but so just just for reference, if I mention Athan, that is actually Odysseus. So just to get that out of the way, he also said that he met Bellerophon a couple times. No, they was, did that not was say a pretty that. Cool he did not drop. say that. It was a cool name drop. No one talks about Bellerophon. I talk about Bellerophon. You talk about Bellerophon. That's about it. WWBD. What would Bellerophon do, Dustin? <laughs> We're going to make some bracelets. Yep. <laughs> this is our new merch. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, Athan, who is Odysseus, hosts Odysseus. <laughs> I know that's confusing since the Dominus has left. Now, this causes Penelope to weep because, you know, he's talking about her husband. But when she dries her tears, she decides <laughs> to put the stranger to the test. And this test is asking him what Odysseus looked like, what he was wearing, and who his comrades were. Because only someone who actually met Odysseus would know all that information. Well, the stranger, who again is Odysseus in disguise, he responds with, Oh lady, it is hard with so long a time between to tell you that. For twenty years are gone since he set forth and left my land. Still, I will tell you how my mind makes him appear. A cloak of purple wool Odysseus wore, made with a double fold. A brooch of gold upon it was fashioned with twin buckles, the front part ornamented. 
In his forepaws, a dog held down a spotted fawn and clutched it as it writhered. This all admired and marveled how, though things of gold, the dog would clutch and choke the fawn, and how the fawn that struggled to escape would twitch its feet. His tunic, too, I noticed, gleamed across the flesh, just like the skin stripped down from a dried onion, so smooth it was, and glistening (laughs) like the sun, (laughs) right? (laughs) And truly, many a woman gazed on the man with wonder, but this I will say further, mark it well. I do not know if Odysseus wore this dress at home, or if a comrade gave it when he entered the swift ship, or yet perhaps some host. Odysseus was beloved by many men, few of the Achaeans equally. I gave him gifts myself, a sword of bronze, a beautiful purple doublet and bordered tunic, and I sent him off with honor on his well-bent ship. A herald, a little older than myself, attended him. I will describe what manner of man this herald was, bent in the shoulders, swarthy, curly-haired, and named Eurybates. Odysseus honored him beyond his other comrades because he had a mind that suited well his own. Now, obviously, this being Odysseus describing it, he described Odysseus, you know, perfectly. Exactly what he was wearing, who he hung out with, everything. What a man. And, of course, he had to throw in all the women were drooling over him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he just looked so amazing. Because he's talking about himself. You know, you got to pump yourself up, you know. I mean, well, every, every time I tell my wife stories, I'm like, and you know what? This Neil kid, mm. long neck <laughs> Neil, he was dope. Everybody loved him. Couldn't wait. Yeah. She she probably knew that's, that that's was what she, it's, it's beautiful that she doesn't listen to the podcast much because then I'm like, man, I really, Dustin, he thanked me on the podcast for being his friend. He said that I have saved and changed his life. Yeah. Yeah, you've made my life so she, much better. With all she, your... Her knowing you, she doesn't believe it, but... <laughs> That's but. fair. That's fair. I don't blame her. I wouldn't <laughs> believe it either. So after he described himself perfectly, she gets really overwhelmed with grief because now she knows for a fact that he has actually seen her husband. So she starts to weep, but when she, she gets herself together again, and then Odysseus starts to sympathize with her, but then... He sympathizes for what she's feeling because she thinks that the stranger has saw her husband and she's never going to see him, that he was the last person to see Odysseus to her knowledge, you know, that can describe him to her and that tears her up. But Odysseus knows that that's not true because he is Odysseus, but he can't say anything. So he's kind of torn about that. So, so to kind of cheer her up, he assures her that, Odysseus is still alive and on his way home. And he tells her this, that he heard it from the king of the Thesprotians. And he recounts how Odysseus' crew was lost after eating the sun god's animals. You know, we talked about that earlier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All the crew was lost, but he survived and arrived at the land of the Phaeacians and that the Phaeacians were bringing him home. They gave him, you know, gifts. They treated him with honor and they were bringing him home. Rest assured he was going to be there soon. (laughs) <laughs> he left out, uh, you know, Cersei and <laughs> Calypso and all that stuff. But anyway, Penelope appreciates this story, but she still feels that Odysseus is lost forever. But she does offer the stranger a bed and to have his feet washed. Well, the stranger, who's Odysseus, declines the bed and says only a soul as tortured as his would be allowed to clean his feet. He doesn't, you know, he wants someone that knows strife and sorrow to wash his feet. And Penelope's like, I got just the person. And she summons the old nurse, uh, Euryclea, to wash his feet. So they go into, like, an adjacent room to where from where Penelope is. And Euryclea, she puts cold water in the basin, and then she puts hot water in it. And then when she goes to wash his feet, she sees something. She feels something. Oh, my. It's a scar it's on his... one of those episodes. Oh, <laughs> no. a scar. Okay. I said Good. feet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't know. <laughs> I, I suppose that's accurate. Yep. She feels and, and sees something on his foot, and she instantly recognizes it. It's a scar that only Odysseus had, 
You know, she's probably washed Odysseus's feet a bunch of times, so she knows it well. And it's a scar that he obtained as a youth. It doesn't really say how old he was, but I'm assuming, let's just say he was like, what, 11, 12? Sure. Deal. Yeah. He was probably even younger because it's a story about Odysseus, but we'll just go with he was 11. He went to stay with his grandfather, uh, Autolycus, and uh, Autolycus' sons, which would be his uncles, and they went on a boar hunt. Well, Odysseus ends up cornering this boar by himself, and the boar, like, charges at him, and Odysseus dodges out of the way, but its tusk caught Odysseus' foot. And that's what left the scar. It went all the way to the bone, and that's where he got the scar. And I think he ended up killing the boar because it's Odysseus, and Odysseus does dope stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's an 11-year-old killing a wild boar with a spear. It is what it is. And she immediately recognizes that it's Odysseus. And she goes to, like, embrace him, you know, and, like, kind of scream in excitement. And Odysseus kind of clasps his hand over her mouth, and he's like, Nurse, are you trying to get me killed? What are you thinking? Chill. And he kind of threatens her, like, you need to just... You don't say a word. Do not let Penelope know anything. And while this is going on, Athena comes up with some kind of distraction to keep Penelope from looking in there and see what's going on. Well, after Odysseus tells Euryclea, like, hey, chill, yeah, it's me, but don't let Penelope know. She's like, you ain't got nothing to worry about. My lips are sealed. Secret's safe with me. Don't worry about it. So she goes to fetch some more water because, you know, she knocked the basin over in excitement. And continues to wash his feet. Well, after the f- the uh, foot washing, Odysseus gets closer to the fire to warm up, and Penelope comes in, and she tells him about a dream she's had recurring. She's like, maybe you can help me understand what it means, because I don't know. Now, in this dream, she has 20 geese, and an eagle comes down from the mountains and kills all 20 geese by breaking their necks. Then the eagle lands in the rafters of the palace and starts speaking in a human voice. And what the eagle says is, Courage, O daughter of renowned Icarius. This is no dream, but true reality, which yet shall come to pass. The geese are suitors, and I, the eagle, was at the first a bird, but now, the second time, and come your husband to bring a ghastly doom on all the suitors. And she's like, what does that mean? Yeah, what could what could that possibly mean? Am I the eagle? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought this part was kind of funny because that dream explained itself yep. as she explained yeah, it too. If ever there was a dream in <laughs> yeah. a story that didn't need interpreting, <laughs> this was it. <laughs> so I imagine Odysseus kind of gives her a funny look like, really? But he tells her. He tells her what he thinks it means. He says... Lady, the dream cannot be understood by resting it onto other meanings. Odysseus surely has himself revealed what yet shall be. The suitor's overthrow is plain. On all it falls, none shall escape from death and doom. Yeah, I agree. That's pretty much what yeah. That's what I get out of it anyway. I actually just think that there's going to be a talking eagle, which is probably... And a bunch Bel- of geese. It's probably Bellerophon. <laughs> Probably, who will yeah. show up, kill the suitors. Yeah, the god Bellerophon. <laughs> who will show up, kill the suitors, and he's going to rescue Penelope, and they're going to live happily ever after. Mm-hmm. Yep. That sounds right. I should write fan fiction. You should. Thank you. What If, if Bellerophon was a god, what would he be? The god of heroes? <laughs> we got a flight. <laughs> the god of flight. <laughs> the god of winged horses. <laughs> <laughs> and then losing it. Yep. And then getting zapped. <laughs> <laughs> so, even after this, Penelope is still not convinced that Odysseus will ever return, and she concedes to the stranger that she must remarry, but she tells him that she wishes to hold a contest to decide who shall she remarry. Now, this contest is consists of stringing Odysseus's bow and then firing one single arrow through 12 axe rings. Now, axe rings are the little rings at the bottom of an axe handle. So this person will have to string this bow and shoot one single arrow through 12 holes, pretty much, cleanly. 
And Odysseus is like, you know what? That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I think you should do that tomorrow, as yeah. a matter of fact. Don't waste any time with it. Yeah. That's the perfect plan. You you go ahead and do that. So with that, the two part, and then they enjoy their own restless night. And that's how we end book night. Yeah, perfect. Well, that, so that brings up the ambiguity of Penelope. Does she or doesn't she know? So a lot of what happens with Penelope can be chalked down to it actually being her understanding what's happening. So um, they call it the early recognition. That's what a lot of the scholars uh, describe it as. And the best way to explain it is there, there, if you translate it from the original Greek terms, there's a couple terms that uh, in the quotes that actually translate a little bit different than for us. So when she tells the dream to Odysseus, in the original translation, she says, uh, listen first and then interpret. So, or, yeah, no, it was interpret first, then listen. So she's telling him, if this is what they're saying on the early recognition, if you listen to, or if you interpret what I'm trying to say you in this coded message, then you can listen. So if, let's say, she is someone who knows, she recognizes them immediately. Probably, if she does recognize them, it's probably because of, one, the the joke that he makes. It's a little tongue-in-cheek remark to her about Odysseus being such a fine man, getting all these Crete women. Because no old beggar in his right mind would tell an old queen, or not an old queen, a queen who is grieving over her husband that, man, though, did he pull some tail in Crete. Right. I mean, it's a little tongue-in-cheek remark. And I think that that's about, if we could pinpoint it to a certain time frame, that's when I would say that she does know if she does. And maybe she's still unsure, and maybe she hedges her bet. Maybe she decides that stringing the bow, like, if this is Odysseus, stringing the bow, only he can do it. Yeah. If not, it'll buy me some more time. But let's say she is, for the sake of argument. She does know that it's him. First, she says, well, I had this crazy dream. Um, are you going to kill the suitors? And he goes, hmm, I might be. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. And then she goes, huh. What would happen if I gave you the bow? He's like, I would use that bow. You should do that tomorrow. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a pretty good argument, too. And you ought to also take in mind, look at the, the difference in her reaction. So think back to the, the last three books. She's been this, this character who's had literally no substance to her, just this grieving wife. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, she, the first actually, the first thing we even hear from her in book 19 is her berating her uh, handmaiden, uh, Melanthos, and she says, you, actually I have the quote right here, hang on, how well you knew, you heard from my own lips what uh, that I meant to probe this stranger in our house and ask about my husband, my heart breaks for him, first quote that we hear from Penelope, and then the first thing she says to Odysseus the stranger is not, have you seen my husband, it's, where do you come from, mm -hmm. who are you, so it's kind of a, a strange little situation, then when he tells the details, then she goes, nope, my husband's dead. All of a sudden, it's a complete change. Yeah. It's, I think that my husband could still be out there. And then all of a sudden, it's, my husband's dead. Now, why would she do that? Well, she's got a lot of spies um, in there. So she's got to talk to him coded message. And then, like, Odysseus kind of throws a, a curveball in it because he feels bad for her. And she's like, you know, if you could just shut up about that. My husband's dead. Stop talking. <laughs> and then... He still keeps doing it. And then finally, she's like, maybe we could get someone to wash your feet, you know, because maybe you've got something weird going on with your feet, Odysseus. And he's like, no, I don't I don't think I would like someone to wash my feet. And she's like, yeah, I, I've got just a person to wash, wash your foot. And then lo and behold, yep. the right person does. It just, it, everything seems a little too convenient because keep in mind. Everything if, fits too perfectly. If... If Homer puts it in there, there's a reason for it. Yeah. He doesn't just tell us these random little anecdotes. And actually, one of my favorite quotes I actually wrote down from Fagels, which is my the, the version that I use for the translation, he says, um, th and the introduction, this is why he explains that Homer is such a standing and sticking uh, author, is Homer shows us character and motivation, not by editorial explanation, but through speech and action. We are not told what is going on through the minds of his characters. We are shown. And what better way can we show that Penelope's not some weak and pathetic, typical, um, heroic woman than by having her be this mischievous and beguiling woman? 
Because we'll also see, in the end, she tricks Odysseus again. Because I don't think Odysseus knows. I don't think Odysseus realizes, if she does know, that she recognizes him. Because when they finally meet, in the end, she does a trick to trick him into revealing who he is, you know? Well, yeah, because Odysseus... Well, another... trick. To agree, to agree with you there, Odysseus also has a pretty big ego. Mm-hmm. So he's probably thinking... Man, she doesn't know yeah. what to think. I, I got. So I am freaking, so good at lying. I'm so freaking witty. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm so clever and dope. And man, did you see how mad she got when I made that remark? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, Odysseus but, might be blinded by yeah. his own uh, pr- ego right there. <laughs> but yeah, I just I I feel like that they're onto something. I do believe that they're they're right. I think that she she does know. Um, that's my side of it. The other side of it, people say, well. You know, there are elements that don't stick with it, like uh, the way that she reacts to, you know, bringing up the bow. That's such a a strange time to say that. But the argument against that is, why would she bring that up? Like, if she's like, oh, man, I can't can't make a decision. What if I just make them string up this bow? Yeah, Um, you think think that's something she just came up with right then and there? I think I need to settle down now. Okay, well, why don't you just, you know, pick something better to decide? And there's one other thing that I'm starting to notice, too. I think ancient Greeks might have had a foot fetish, Dustin. They might have had a foot fetish. There's a lot of feet washing. There's a lot of feet washing. There's a lot of feet recognition. Remember Menelaus? He recognized Telemachus because his feet looked like his dad's foot. Yeah. There's there's some weird things going on. Well, uh, well, I think feet washing was just kind of like a thing back then because it's even mentioned like biblically. Yeah. It's wow. it's like a sign of like fetish humbleness and. Washing someone's feet and getting getting close, mm-hmm. getting them toes on. Yep. Yeah. So they might have had a foot fetish. I'm just saying. Perhaps. I'm just you can't saying. rule it out. I mean, we've you got. Can't rule it we've out. already established a correlation between a black market of shepherds stealing babies in the wilderness and selling them to royalty, specifically on mountain sides. On mountain sides. <laughs> And now, you know, maybe there's a foot fetish. I don't know. I'm not saying anything, but I am saying it. Okay? Yeah. And then there's one Things last thing. Things are stacking up. <laughs> there's one last thing I wanted to bring up. Um, so with the scar, it actually, there's a little bit of that in that tale that they explain um, the origins of his name. So the yeah, uh, his grandfather gave him the name Odysseus, which is, uh, it, it could be translated in multiple ways, but the, the best way that they found is he who gives and uh, gives pain, or no, he who inflicts pain and he who receives pain, which is, kind of the best way to describe the story of Odysseus' yeah. life. Everywhere he goes, he inflicts and receives pain because he just can't get out of his own way. Odysseus, just just stop, man. But I'm about to hit you with some Matrix stuff right here. If Autolycus hadn't named him Odysseus, would he still have done all this stuff? No, because Athena wouldn't have cared. Because exactly. then it wouldn't have rhymed with Odysseus. <laughs> hit you back with some Matrix <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was mind a, blown. That was a paradox right there. <laughs> mind blown. But you know bro. what? I bet if he wasn't named Odysseus, I bet that Bellerophon would have gotten his time to shine. Oh my god! All right, and that's 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 the sad part. That's the sad part. Everybody, everyone that's listening and has stuck it out, just know that it's BS. That Odysseus gets to walk around and strut around with his his scantily dressed bum, while Bellerophon gets his horse stolen from him by. Hercules and the Disney movie, and by Perseus and um, Clash of the Titans. I'm just saying it's bullcrap. It is. WWBD. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's all I really had to say, though, guys. Thank, Thank you, you for that Bellerophon shout out yeah. yet again. Plug. <laughs> Plug Bellerophon. <laughs> oh, my God. So that takes us to book 20. I going to make it. I was going to make book 20 kind of. Lack some luster now, but well, I don't know because this first part of book twenty I found kind of relatable. Oh, the the book's good. It's just, I mean, how can you follow up Bellerophon? <laughs> you can't, man. He's the end all be all. So in book twenty, it starts with Odysseus lying down on the floor. He doesn't lay down on a bed. He just throws like a fleece down, and that's where he's going to sleep. But he's unable to sleep, and the reason is he is wrestling with his anger towards the suitors. And his, you know, he's giddy about one. He he wants to snuff him out immediately, but he's also feeling fear, fear of failure because this is his home and family that's at stake, and he has to try to pep talk himself 
by reminding reminding him, he's like, hey, you know, we we faced worse odds. You know, we were stuck in a cave with a cyclops that was eating us, and we got out of that. You sack Troy? You did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's he's trying to talk himself up, but it's not working. And I understand why here because. You know, you you know, you might have a dangerous job, and it it doesn't bother you as much as if there's danger when you're at home, because right. that's your family. You know, in Odysseus's case, he's the first and last line of defense. If he fails, you know, his family's going, his home's going down. So that is a fear that he's wrestling with. Like I, it, I can easily fail. It's two v twenty or or more. You know, we can easily die, and if that happens, then. My son's dead. They'll probably kill Penelope or worse. And yeah, that's a real fear. And I think a lot of people can relate yeah. to that. I mean, it's easy too when when it's just this long shot goal that you're just mindlessly trying to obtain. It's it's not the stakes aren't high because you're just like, all right, well that was another curveball. Let me just keep going. Just keep yep. plugging. Keep going. And then all of a sudden, it's real. Like the next day, you're like, oh god, okay, uh, oh all right, this is happening, guys. We're here. Yep. You know, so it's easy to get pumped up. Yeah. So he's kind of, you know, psyching himself out. And that is when Athena comes to him and asks why he's not sleeping. And Odysseus tells her, you know, hey, I'm struggling with this. And Athena gives him some godly advice. She says, oh, doubter. <laughs> Men trust weaker friends, friends who are mortal and not wise as I. I am a god and will protect you to the end through all your toils and let me tell you plainly, should 50 troops of mortal men stand round about us, eager in the fight to slay, you still might drive them away from their oxen and sturdy sheep. No, no, let slumber come. Evil it is to watch and wake all the night long. You shall come, come forth from peril yet. So she lays down the law like, hey, you got nothing to worry about. I'm a god. Yeah. I can literally do anything to you mortals. She took that personally. Yeah, she did. She's like, you know She's what? Like, you know, you trust your comrades yeah. who are men. I'm a god. Do you know how bad you're making me look right now? Yeah. <laughs> I am really, my friends already make fun of me because I care about humans, and then you little piss ant are sitting here <laughs> trying to act like you're not going to win with my help. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she does not. Really tested me, boy. <laughs> she, uh, that doesn't sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> that does not sparkle with her. So after she gives him that harsh speech, she pours sleep upon him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with that. Go to sleep. <laughs> and then she departs back to Olympus. Which is even funnier when you think about it, that there's a god of sleep. So I just kind of imagine like just like a pouring him on. Yep. Just. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> sleep. Exactly. And he's like, he comes out like a Pokemon. Just like, sleep. You know, you know what I'm talking about. He hits like him with yawn. Oh. I mean, I just meant like, you know, Pokemon say their names, but yeah, yawn too. Yep. Sleep. Snorlaxes him. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, meanwhile, while Odysseus gets put to sleep, Penelope wakes up from her sleep. Hmm. She wakes up crying and, you know, wishing that Odysseus was here. And then she begins to pray to Artemis. Now, what she prays for from Artemis is death. Okay. She's like, Artemis, please strike me down with your arrow, because if I can't be with Odysseus, then I do not want to marry a lesser man. Do not make me, you know, and I don't want to see anything bad happen to my son. Just kill me. Yeah. Just kill me so I don't got to deal with this. What could go wrong? Yeah, right? When praying to Artemis for that, <laughs> that's probably the last one you want, because she'd be more than happy to oblige. Yeah. So, Odysseus actually wakes up at the back end of this prayer and kind of hears Penelope. And, you know, you know, it makes him feel pretty sad. He's like, oh, my wife's wishing for death and I can't, can't do anything yet, but maybe today will be the day. Today's going to be the day. I got this. So he folds up his fleece and puts it on the bench and heads down to the, I guess it would be the main palace, like the banquet hall or whatever. And while he's walking there, he prays to Zeus for a sign that he will be victorious and that everything will be copacetic. So, you know, he starts praying, and sure enough, a big boom of thunder resounds through the palace. And there's actually, like, a group of, like, a dozen women that make barley and, like, cornmeal and stuff, 
every day. And one of those uh, ladies actually hears the thunder and she says out loud, well, there's not a cloud in the sky and that's thunder. That's Zeus saying these suitors are going to get ghosted pretty much. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, that's what she says. And both of those signs please Odysseus. He's like, all right, I heard the thunder and I heard the lady proclaim that it'll be doomed to the suitors. So we're good to go. So that kind of makes Odysseus feel even better about what's about to transpire. Now, Telemachus also wakes up and he immediately asks uh, Euryclea if the stranger was taken care of. And the way he kind of asks it, he's kind of harsh about Penelope, his mom, when he asks it. He's like, hey, was my mom like, you know, because I know, was she nice to him? Because I know she's kind of in this funk where she's nice to people she shouldn't be nice to and mean to people she should be nice to. And Euryclea is like, eh, don't blame someone that's, that's, you know, blameless. She took very good care of the stranger. Even though she offered him a bed, he declined because he's an animal. That's really <laughs> what she says. <laughs> He'd rather sleep on the floor like a beast or something like that. And But no, he was very well taken care of. And uh, Telemachus is like, oh, okay, that's what's up. Never mind then. I take back what yeah. I said about my mom. So with that... <laughs> Uh, Euryclea and the uh, servant gals start preparing the palace for the suitors. Now, before the suitors get there, Eumaeus, the swineherd, enters and greets Odysseus and asks if his situation is getting any better there, if you're still mean to him. And immediately after asking that, Melanthius comes back, <laughs> the goat herd, and he once again insults Odysseus. And is like, you're still here? Oh, man, the only thing that made me happy is... Punching in the face. That's really what he says. <laughs> and it, it's wild. And then after him, the uh, cattle herd, uh, Philodius, arrives. And he's actually very, very friendly to this, the stranger, which is Odysseus. He's like, hey, where are you from, stranger? You know, this and that. And wishes him all the good fortune and everything. He's just a really plucky guy. <laughs> he's He's nice. And... Odysseus sees that the cattle herd is loyal and wise, and he prophesizes that he will see Odysseus slay the suitors right soon. He's like, you will see it with your own eyes, because Philodius is loyal to Odysseus. He talks about how he misses Odysseus and how he would like to leave, but he can't because he still has hope that Odysseus will return, and he wants to be there when he does. So with that prophecy, the cattle herd, Philodius, is like, oh, that would be awesome. If that happened, you'd see how loyal and strong I am. I'd, you know, I'd hop too. That's virtually what he says. So after that, the suitors arrive and they start killing all the animals and, you know, getting the feast prepared. And they're still contemplating killing Telemachus. <laughs> This is still going on. Yeah. They're still thinking about it. They're still waiting for that sign that Amphinomus was asking for. Well, sure enough, they get it. Amphinomus sees an eagle clutching a dove flying above them, and he points it out to the suitors. He's like, hey, that eagle's clutching a dove. That's got to be a sign from Zeus saying it's a bad idea to kill Telemachus, so I think we should leave him alone. And the suitors are like, all right, yeah, I'm cool with that. <laughs> what a bad idea anyway, so whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever. No big deal. So then the feast begins, and while feasting, Telemachus makes it perfectly clear that there is not to be any funny business about the stranger. Don't mess with don't don't mess with anybody. It's pretty much what he t tells everyone. Like, hey, just like, keep it a chill day, you know. Stop throwing <laughs> stools at him. Yeah, don't start nothing. Won't be nothing. Well, Athena has other plans. She wants Odysseus to stay, you know, mad at the suitors. She wants him to be red hot, you know, fuming. So she puts it into a young, wealthy, arrogant suitor named uh Ctesippus. she puts it in his mind to mock him because they, they give him a, a portion of food equal to their own at this feast and Ctesippus stands up and is like yo he's good you know he's got a portion equal to ours and you know what i'll give him a little more and he picks up a cow hoof and hucks it at him <laughs> And almost hits him in the head, but Odysseus sees it and narrowly ducks underneath it, and the cow hoof hits against the wall. And Odysseus kind of gives a 
sly little angry grin like, all right, yep, I'm killing mm. everybody today. It's yep. on. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about sparing a couple people, but you know what? <clears throat> Throwing a hoof. Yep. Not taking it. So Telemachus sees this, and he immediately responds with threatening to cut down Catespus right then and there with the sword. Well, one of the suitors then speaks up is like, hey, you know, I know you don't like us and don't want us here, but if you just tell your mom to hurry up and choose a new husband, then we'll be out of your hair, bro. Just tell her to choose. And he's like, hey, I told her to choose somebody. I want her, I want you guys out of here. I told her to choose. She just doesn't think any of you guys are good. <laughs> and they're like, oh, that can't be. They're literally like, Pfft. they laugh at him because none of them think that can be possible. Jerry. Like, there's no, what? There's no way she thinks none of us are worthy because they're so into themselves. So, suitors laugh and, you know, they're making fun of Telemachus. Well, unbeknownst to them, Theoclamenus, the, pro- the descendant of the prophet that uh, met with Telemachus in, was it, was it Sparta where he met him? Or was it Pyrrhos? I think it was Sparta, but I'm not high. Yeah, it was well, it was one of the two. He met him there and came back with him. He's there in the banquet, and apparently ability to be a prophet is inherited because he sees all the suitors covered in blood and blood on the walls, and they all have this ghostly foreign appearance. And he immediately stands up and he's like, You guys are all doomed. You guys are going to die. I can see it. Like, you're doomed. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what, <laughs> pretty much exactly what he says. And he's like, you, you, you know, I don't know what you guys are laughing about. You're all you're all doomed. You're yep. all going to die. I can see it. Well, they get mad at him, start making fun of him, and they try to kick him out. And he's like, you know what? I know my own way out. Yeah. And he gets up and leaves and meets back with uh, Perithius, who is one of Telemachus's best friends. And that's who he's going to stay with instead of with Telemachus. He's like, I'll be danged if I'm going to be thrown out by a bunch of ghosts. <laughs> right? A bunch of dead uh, men. Yeah, well, I'll walk <laughs> myself out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Touch me with your taint. Yep. And that is how... <laughs> that is how we end book 20. Hey, Dustin. With some taint touching. <laughs> yep. Some taint touching. Hey, uh, Dustin, what do you think uh, Odysseus said when that, that hoof was thrown at him? I don't know. <laughs> it behooves me to kill these suitors. <laughs> Woo! Oh, I wish we sat closer so I could punch yeah. you <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yes. You know, it's just beautiful. Yo, I didn't even come prepared for that one. That's poetry in motion yep. right there. That's Homer. That is that is audible honey. Mm. <laughs> let's get on audible. Let's do it. Yep, let's do it. Do you have anything to add for book twenty? No, that was that was it right there. Okay. The hoof. The <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is all you had to say. Nope. <laughs> so book twenty one starts with Athena putting in Penelope's mind the idea to retrieve the bow and announce the contest. So that's exactly what she does. Now a little backstory on the bow. The bow was actually a gift to Odysseus from Iphitus. If you guys remember, Iphitus was the one in our uh, Heracles episode that there was a con there was an archery contest. Yeah. The winner of this archery contest would marry the daughter of Eurydice, which is if father. And uh, I believe it was Iola. Iola. Iola was the daughter that was to be married to the winner of this archery contest. Well, Heracles wins it. And don't forget that this is also the part where Dustin was like all hyped on. Uh, Heracles, and I was like, uh, "Don't forget that the bow can't miss." That is so, true. So don't don't let no Dustin no 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 no. That was the part with the birds, oh. Tim Phalian birds. Yeah, well, Dustin Dustin played up his archery skills a lot, but the man had a bow that couldn't miss, so real hard. <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. Like the Smallville, where he just kicks the ball and it just goes in. I can't argue with that. Yeah, no, or not Smallville. Was this? No, that's not. I don't know what you're talking about. So. Doesn't matter. It's like that movie. <laughs> you're on your own there. <laughs> so he wins this contest to win the hand of Eola, the daughter of Eurydice, who was the father of Iphitus. 
But they won't, uh, Eurydice won't let her marry Heracles because he's like, hey, you went mad once before and killed your whole family. And I think you'll probably do that to my daughter. So I'm not going to let you marry him, marry her. And he's like, well, well, that's rude, but okay, whatevs. Well, later on, Autolycus, Odysseus's grandfather. It was Pleasantville. Was it? That was a movie I was talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <Keep going. laughs> I'm glad you looked that up. <laughs> well, Autolycus comes by and steals a bunch of Eurydice's uh, sheep. And after that, they blame Heracles because they're like, well, he's mad that we wouldn't let him marry or you know, I wouldn't let him marry my daughter. It has to be him. And Eurydice and all of his sons think, oh, yeah, it had to be Heracles. The only one that doesn't think Heracles did it is if it is. If it is, is like, I don't think he did it, guys. I think we're jumping the gun here. And I also would like to point out that what are we going to do about it if he did? Right. What were they going to do about it yeah. if he did? Exactly. Where do you? How do you think this is going to play out in your yeah. mind? Because well, you're going to you're going to confront Heracles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you go right on ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I just became king yeah. overnight, right? <laughs> well, I just killed you all and married your daughter anyway, yeah. so <laughs> it is what it is. I got mine. <laughs> so, what happened to Iphidus is he goes to Heracles to talk to him. And to make sure that he wasn't one that did it, because he, you know, he's like, "Hey, Heracles, my family thinks you're the one that did it. I know you didn't. We just need some proof." Heracles is like, "Oh, okay," and shakes his hand, and everything's cool. But then Hera makes Heracles go mad, and Heracles picks up Iphitus and throws him off the walls of Tyran, or the cliffs of Tyran, and kills him right there. But before that happened, Odysseus had a run-in with Iphitus over some. There was some sheep that were taken from Ithaca, and Odysseus had to go find out who did it. And on the way, he met Iphitus, and they became friends. And Iphitus actually gave him his bow. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm still just playing out in my mind again. Just Heracles, like, great man, you know what? I appreciate that handshake. Picks yeah, you got up. my back, man. <laughs> just drops. Yeah, you got my back, man. I really appreciate it. Good looking out. <laughs> just hulks out and he's like what are you doing <laughs> and just grabs him <laughs> I thought we were cool man what are you no, doing no, no. <laughs> that's such a raw deal for if it is <laughs> like that's so raw <laughs> poor yeah, bastard the gods, the <laughs> gods are just ruthless man I know <laughs> <laughs> he was being such a cool guy <laughs> And that's how we got the theme of our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right? That is. It's stuff like that that gave us this idea. So it, anyway, that's that's where Odysseus yeah. got the bow was from yeah. <laughs> before he was thrown off a cliff by yeah. one of his friends. Oh. So. So Penelope addresses the suitors after displaying the bow and lays down the rules of the contest. Which is, you know, string the bow, shoot one arrow through 12 axe rings. Then she has Eumaeus bring the bow down to the suitors. Now, seeing the bow of their king makes Eumaeus and uh, Philodius start to weep. You know, it, it, you know, it hits them hard. They're like, oh, man, this is really, he must really be gone if we've come to this. His bow. <laughs> yeah, his bow. Well, uh, Antonis you know, one of the jerk suitors starts mocking them for crying. Like, what are you crying for? Uh, you, you herdsmen get out of here. <laughs> Pretty much what he said. Yeah. <laughs> well, Telemachus is very eager of this challenge and he sets up the axes and then he gives string and the bow a try. So he's the first to go. Now he struggles and is unable to string the bow three times. But it says he probably would have gotten it on the fourth had he not seen Odysseus shaking his head, signaling for him not to. Like, hey, don't, yeah, look, look, don't this string is, it. This is mine. Yep. Don't, 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 st don't steal my thunder yeah. here. <laughs> I had this all planned out, yeah. man. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> so with that, Telemachus stops, and then he has the suitors line up and attempt, you know. We almost had an Oedipus uh, complex going on here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like what, what? What? Why was he even trying? Like I just want to know. Like I think it was just for like pride's sake to see if he could do it. 
now you're my wife. <laughs> well, maybe that was his plan. Like, hey, if I string him for anyone else, I can just kick you out because I'm the ruler. I mean, I guess maybe. I don't I, know. I don't know. I wasn't there. So I couldn't <laughs> tell you. <laughs> Some weird things going on in this story now. So, uh,. After that, he you know he has everyone line up and attempt single fire file. The first that attempts out of the suitors is Leo uh, Leodes, who is kind of their soothsayer, and he personally abhors the suitor crowd. He's not down with it. He thinks they're you know a bunch of jerks too. He fails at stringing the bow and immediately exclaims that the bow will rob many chiefs of life, and they should all leave and find wives elsewhere. Well, they refuse. They're like, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah, and Antonus has Melanthius start a fire and grab a cake of fat in hopes of loosening and greasing the bow up. Because if you, you know, if you put wood next to a fire and grease it up, it's supposed to make it more pliable. So they get that going. And while that's happening, Odysseus, Eumaeus, and Philodius go outside. Odysseus is going to need help. So he's trying to recruit these two to help him. And to do so, he tests their loyalty by asking... He's like, hey, if Odysseus was to show up right here, right now, if some god dropped him off, or if he popped up out of nowhere, would you help him or would you help the suitors and be honest? Well, obviously, they're both loyal to Odysseus, so that we would help Odysseus. Like, yeah, in a, in a heartbeat. And that is where we get come to the quote that we read for you at the beginning of the episode. He reveals himself to them. He's like, okay, well, I'm Odysseus surprise <laughs> it's me and to prove it i will show you my scar that i obtained from the boar they see it and they're like oh my god it is odysseus and odysseus promises that if they help he'll give them homes right next to his he'll give them wives and status and he they, you know he'll look upon them like telemachus they will be equal in status and then after that they all start you know weeping and kissing each other on the head and hugging and, you know, there's a big happy reunion kind of thing going on. Well, then Odysseus cuts it short because he doesn't want to get spotted, obviously, and get outed. So he's like, all right, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go in one at a time. I'll go in first, and then you guys come in later so as they don't suspect any, expect anything. Now, when the suitors are done with the bow, Eumaeus, you're going to bring me the bow. And while that's happening, Philodius, you're going to go outside and you're going to lock the courtroom door. You're going to bar it shut so the suitors can't get out. And then you may ask, after you give me the bow, you're going to go to uh, the handmaids and you're going to tell them to lock themselves in their room and just kind of do their work. And no matter what they hear, do not interfere. Do not open the door and come check it out. Stay in your room and do some work or something. Just do not come in. So that's the plan. And with that, Odysseus comes back in, sits down where he was originally seating, and then the other two come in shortly after. Now, uh, let's see here. Now, Antonis just tried, or you, I'm sorry, Eurymachus has just tried the bow, and he is unable to, to string it and he feels quite a bit of shame for this because it now hits him that he is a far lesser man than odysseus because he could not string this bow and he's not taking it too well or well, antonis chimes in and says it must be because it's the day of apollo's high feast no one's gonna be able to string a bow today it's the day of the archer god's feast so yeah what are we doing so this is what we're gonna do we're gonna leave everything here we're just gonna you know pour some libations and then tomorrow we're going to come in, make some sacrifices, you know, make some offerings. I shouldn't say sacrifices, but some offerings. And then, yeah, we'll string it no problem. You know, no big deal. We are men. Yeah. Well, all the men agree. They're like, yeah, that's a great idea. It's got to be because it's Apollo's feast. That's why we can't string it. Well, Odysseus then announces that he would like to attempt stringing the bow. He's like, I just want to see if I can do it. I want to see if my muscles are still strong. and. I'm not a feeble old man anymore if I still got it. It's He's saying it's pretty much for his pride. Now, the suitors do not greet this very welcomely. It actually angers them quite a bit. Because they for, it says that they have a fear that he might be able to do it. Because they saw how he whooped up on that uh, 
other beggar earlier that was actually, you know, pretty well built and Odysseus, you know, turned the lights off in one hit. So they're a little weary of this guy. And Penelope is like, hey, let him do it. You honestly think I'd marry him? He's a beggar. <laughs> Even if he strings it, I'm not going to marry him. You guys got nothing to worry about. And Euromox is like, oh, we know you're not going to marry him if he yeah. strings it. He's a beggar. But what we're worried about is if he's able to string it as a beggar, that's going to dishonor us. It's going to make us look shameful. No, no, no. You misunderstand us. We know you won't marry him. We're worried about our honor. Yeah. And Penelope actually has a good rebuttal to that. She goes, Euromachus, men cannot be in honor in the land and rudely rob the household of their prince. Why then count this as shame? <laughs> like, what do you, where's the, where's the line here? You guys are destroying my family and house and, and money, but you guys don't want a, a beggar to string a bow. You can't like, what's the line here, boys? The stranger is truly tall and well-knit, too, and calls himself the son of a good father. Give him the polished bow and let us see. For this I tell you, and it shall be done. If he shall bend it in Apollo grants his prayer, I will clothe him in a coat and tunic, goodly garments, give him a pointed spear to keep off dogs and men, a two-edged sword, and sandals for his feet, and I will send him where his heart and soul may bid him go. Well, with that, Telemachus steps in. And he's like, Mom, if anyone has the right to see who can use, you know, or the right to decide who can test this bow, it should be me. I'm kind of the rightful heir here. So this should be my call. So why don't you just go in your room and let me handle this? And she's like, oh, okay. And then she goes into her room. And when she does, she begins to weep for Odysseus. But then Athena comes in and yet again pours some sleep on her. So now Penelope is racked out. Now, after this, Eumaeus picks the bow up and and goes to hand it to Odysseus. But when he does this, the suitors threaten him for it. They're like, you put that bow down, swineherd, or we're going to put you on a ship and take you somewhere and just leave you there. And he's like, oh, oh, well, I don't want that to happen. So he goes to put the bow back down. Well, Telemachus then chimes up. He's like, hey, uh uh-uh. You pick the bow up. I'm in charge here. You pick the bow up. He's like, bow way, Jose. And you give it to the stranger. You like that, oh Destin? Bow way, Jose. I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> bow way, Jose. He's like, you got to bow the line. <laughs> I'm about to leave. <laughs> Don't oh, worry, I've man. got so many of them up right now, bro. <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> oh, my God. Bow dice. <laughs> Are you done? I'll save some. (laughs) Okay. So, with that, Eumaeus picks the bow back up and hands it to Odysseus. Now, at the same time this is happening, Philodius went and barred the courtyard gates with a cable before returning. Now, Odysseus, holding the bow, begins to inspect it to see if worms had gnawed the horn while he was gone. And all the men are looking at him, and some people are saying, like, he is really looking that bow over like he's got one just like it or wants to make one just like it. He knows what he's doing. Looks like he, it's a bow brainer. <laughs> oh my God. I can't, I can't, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> oh man. I hate you. <laughs> so all the suitors are, you know, th- this has their attention. And then Odysseus, you know, disguised as the stranger, easily stretches the sheep gut string in its place and strums it so the suitors could hear its chord. You know, it's like a musical chord, like, you know, like a harp. And he strung it so easy. They're just kind of like jaw dropped right now. He then grabs an arrow, lines up, thunder rings in the distance. Zeus letting Odysseus know it's time. And Odysseus fires a shot, leaves his arrow clean, and passes through all 12 axe rings. And when that happens, Telemachus readies his sword. And that's where we leave you guys off with this episode. 
<laughs> he raises his sword and he says, Bo, my goodness. <laughs> it's bow time. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know Bo. Or Bo, yeah. So many good ones, bro. Oh <laughs> Someone turn his mic off. <laughs> Bo, you think you can dance, Dustin? Mm. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Yeah, so great episode, Dustin. It was a great episode. It was. I, I really liked uh, these three books. I think we should name it Bo Way Jose. I think that that's what we should name this episode. But okay. yeah, I like these three books. They were really good. Bo Way Jose. I like it. Yeah, that's yeah. what it's going to be named. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I read a thing that apparently a lot of people do not like the uh, back half of the Odyssey because they feel he's in disguise too long. And. You know, I can kind of see where they're coming from, but I feel like, and I've read this to confirm my own suspicions, that Homer does this to kind of build suspense. Because that's that's what I get out of it. It's because yeah. you don't know if he's going to get caught or not. I mean, yeah. if you if you know nothing of Greek mythology and this is the first time you're hearing of Odysseus, you don't know if he's if he's going to get found out or not. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, we touched base on that early, uh, a couple episodes I know, ago. but yeah, yeah, that's just wild to me that yeah. so many people dislike the back half of this book after he gets done telling I, I seriously, his, uh, his I think story. that that has more so to do with people go into it thinking, man, the books that they let us read in high school were the Cyclops and uh, Scylla and Charyb- uh, Charybdis, and so, I mean, obviously that this is going to be an action-packed book, and then they find out that those are just the main excerpts. Yeah. I mean... Whatever, get over it. Buckle yeah. up, sweetheart. Yeah, because you don't even Odysseus is even in the book to what book five? Yeah, it's, book it's four insane. or five. Yeah, and he's crying on a beach. Yeah, <laughs> that's the first <laughs> time you see him. Really, yeah, like, <laughs> it's not the most masculine that you've seen him, you know. But, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, that just blew my mind that so many people didn't like the back half because I thought those three in particular were pretty good. Yeah, I think that. Like yeah, said, we left you. We left you guys with a cliffhanger. Because it's about to get real it's next episode. It. Next episode's actually going to be the last episode yeah. of the Odyssey. So, yeah. epic yeah. conclusion coming your way. Yep. Yeah, it's a good episode, Dustin. You did a good job. But yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I don't understand why they wouldn't like it. I think it's everything's on the line. Everything's it's, a, it's like book 10 in the Iliad. Looks yeah. dope. Yeah, Diomedes. Why are you hating on it? Yeah. <laughs> Haters, man. Yeah. That's what it is. I, re- I forgot how mad you were about book 10. You, <laughs> mm, you know what? No, no, we're going to tell it. You, you, we'll let you decide. <laughs> <laughs> I thought book 10 was fun. Yeah. Especially when Odysseus forgot to grab the rain <laughs> or a whip. So they had to like use a bow. Yeah, it was like, to me, it was like a buddy cop sitcom. Yep. You know, they're two opposites just trying to do this wild task yeah. together and. That, that, that's how I, that's yeah. what I got. I thought it was I thought it was fun. Yeah, but you got one that's just balls to the wall, and the other one that's just uh, scheme a scheme a schemer and a doer. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was literally like a sitcom. You knew everything was going to be all right, but, but there's going to be some okay. hijinks. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, appreciate all the support you guys give us. Um, again, WWBD, what would Bellerophon do? Yep. Look out for the bracelets. Look out for the bracelets. Also, if you guys could hit the like button, uh, also subscribe. I'm not saying that maybe, just like in the previous episodes, that Poseidon might curse you, drop a volcano on you. <laughs> maybe not. I'm not saying it, but... Turn some stuff to stone. Turn some stuff to stone. But throw, the gods, throw, throw a mountain on the you. The gods are in our favor. We hit 50,000 downloads, so yep. uh, we're kind of on their radar now. So, Bellerophon, <laughs> all the shout-outs I give him, just saying. We're going to get struck down like Bellerophon yeah, for nope. puffing our chest out. Nope. Hubris. Hubris. <laughs> That's the one thing I've got going for me. All right, thanks again, guys. <laughs> Have a good one. Yep, see you guys next time. That was fun. That was a fun episode.